Slept on Cinema is sponsored by Training Ties, the ultimate shoe tying tool. If you know someone who's struggling with shoe tying for any reason, Training Ties is the perfect solution. Promises to be a masterpiece only to succumb to Hollywood mediocrity, just like its director. You're never asked to invest much in the characters. And by the time you've roused yourself to care, it's too late. Snake Eyes opens on a roll, but ultimately craps out. The second half of the film plays out like a weak need chase yarn that's staged and structured so half-heartedly, you wonder why the filmmakers bothered at all. If you were to review Brian De Palma's Snake Eyes in just one word, it would have to be the sound of air being let out of a balloon. After the premise settles into dust, as it should, the movie crumbles into one big mess where the characters spurt out some incredibly dumb dialogue and act like they're in some sort of Spice Girls music video. It's the worst kind of bad film. The kind that gets you all worked up and lets you down instead of just being lousy from the first shot. Welcome to this week's episode of Slept On Cinema. This week we are getting into Snake Eyes, the 1998 Nicolas Cage, Brian De Palma classic. I'm your host, Stan Steamer. I'm Grobe Street. The house always wins. Everybody wins with this movie. I, this was an exciting time right from the get-go. I think some people will get into this later, complain about it being slow towards the end. I didn't find it particularly slow at any point in the movie. I think it's a great film, great director, great actors, all, all around, great cast. And I, I know we say this every week where I can't believe that this movie was below 50% for both critics and audiences. But this, I think I'm most shocked with this one than any movie we've seen yet. I watched it with my wife. She hadn't watched it before. And she often maybe agrees with some of the ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. And this one blew her mind. She's like, there's no way this qualifies. What are you talking about? Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. I watched it with my, uh, my wife and my, my mother was here actually too. And everyone enjoyed it. I'm almost mad at myself. Most of these movies that we've done on this podcast, we've both seen like so many times throughout the years. I've only seen this movie once, I think, prior to uh, watching it a few times this week. And I wish I had rewatched it more times over the years because for some reason it just has been forgotten. Yeah, I mean, I suppose with Nick Cage, he has so many amazing films that some are just bound to get lost in the shuffle. I get it. Yeah. Rotten premise. Detective Rick Santoro has never played by the rules. When he attends a high-profile boxing match, with his friend, Navy Commander Kevin Dunn, as well as Defense Secretary Kirkland, he witnesses a terrorist assassinate Kirkland. Despite a lockdown on the arena, key witness Julia Costello escapes, and Santoro begins to suspect Kirkland's death as part of a much larger conspiracy that involves boxing rivals and a beautiful stranger. Critics, 40%. Audience, 35%. That's a terrible premise that they wrote. Like that, There's more to that movie than... Boxing rivals. I have. I don't understand why that was the focal point of the premise. The movie goes on for quite a while before you actually see any boxing. You don't. The boxing has almost nothing to do. With it. You know it's fight night, but you don't really know much about the boxers. Right. Right. Uh, so this movie came out August seventh, nineteen ninety eight, and it was second in the box office that weekend. Which I, I feel like we have quite a few films that end up being runners up, and for the second week in a row. We have a movie that was second place to a Spielberg movie. You know, there's nothing you can do when you're going up against a Spielberg movie. So this came out. It was Saving Private Ryan's third week in the box office. You know, all, all timer movie right there. So you you kind of have to count this as it being first because I don't even know if when you go up against a Spielberg movie like Saving Private Ryan that that doesn't really count. No, so, it's like it's like all the NBA players that lost championships because Michael Jordan was just taking everyone's championships in the 90s. It's like Charles Barkley, Patrick Ewing. No one's getting them because there's an all timer who's out in front of you. It doesn't mean you weren't very good. You just were behind one of the best ever. That's a perfect analogy. It's exactly what is happening right here. And that's what happened in this movie. Also, just a, a great time to be a movie fan that end of summer. Halloween H2O also opened that same weekend. Instant wow. classic. And Something About Mary was also in the theaters at the same time, which was, I think, in many ways changed how comedies were done for decades. Absolutely. So great time to be a movie fan. The film made over $100 million worldwide. So again, while this didn't get the critical reception or the 
audience reception somehow. A lot of people still went to see this in the theaters. So in terms of uh, in terms of background here, there's really nothing more to get into than Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage, you put him in a movie, it's going to be fantastic every single time. I will go see a Nicolas Cage movie no matter what the premise is, no matter what the plot is, and I know I'm going to have a fantastic time. So just to give a little bit of background on where he was at this point, obviously won Best Actor Academy Award for Leaving Las Vegas in 1996. But then he really goes on a tear with the uh, awards. 1997 takes home his first Blockbuster Entertainment Awards award for favorite actor in an action or adventure for The Rock. So I think as far as this podcast is concerned, the Blockbuster Entertainment Awards voted on by the people who rent movies at Blockbuster is probably the pinnacle of all award shows. Of course, we'll take that over an Academy Award any day. Any day. I probably voted in these back in the day. So he takes that down 1997. 1998 follows it up. Same category, favorite actor, action adventure for two movies, Con Air and Face Off. Another what? Oh, what a dynamite moment. stretch. Then that, that's leading into this. 1999, of course, he wins for this movie. He wins favorite actor in suspense, different category, wins for Snake Eyes. You can see why he really went for it in this movie. And uh, I think it he pulled it off. He pulled it off in a phenomenal way. I, I also just love the categories that they have in the Blockbuster and, <laughs> and awards, like action and adventure. And then he won for suspense. I don't know how many movies were in the suspense category, but you know, that's beside the point. Well, it's great. That's how we separated, like as a for, former uh, video store worker, uh, that's all the sections of the movie store. So I get how they were doing it. It's like, where, where do you put this movie? And then let's make the awards based on that aisle. That that makes perfect sense. It's some like insider info right there. <laughs> Cage would end up following it off. He had an off year. I don't know what happened in 2000, but in 2001, he'd come back. Uh, he won favorite actor, this time comedy romance for Family Man. Oh, that's a great movie. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the events of 9-11 would end up canceling the show in 2001. 2001 was its last year that it ran. Um, but Nicolas Cage does hold the record for most awards won at the Blockbuster entertainment awards as he should I'll, I'll bet if that was had still been running for the past 20 years he would still hold that award for most one. Oh, i don't i don't doubt that at all i mean he i how, how many years has it been he'd probably have two dozen awards he, I, I don't he'd probably have years where he wins multiple best or it's, it's not even it's not best actor which i especially like about this it's favorite actor which i feel like is is a more honest award because nobody best is Best is a cover for what is your favorite. Yeah. You just call it favorite actor. That's far more honest of a, an award, I think. Yep. And uh, I mean, everyone's favorite to this day is, I mean, a lot of people's favorite is still Nicolas Cage and pretty much anything he he does. And we just, I just saw Pig about a truffle hunter uh, who lost, who had his pig stolen. And the movie was incredible uh, just because Nicolas Cage was in it. I, I agree. I'd say he, my favorite actor in a truffle hunter movie. Easy. <laughs> All right. Should we get into the bolos? I can't wait. There were so many in this movie. Yeah, it's it's interesting, especially the sequence of going from Last Action Hero to this movie now. They both have a number of, of things to be on the lookout for, but in a in a very different way. Like I, I feel like for Last Action Hero, they pumped so much into the background of the movie that every little detail you could watch, and, and it wasn't focused on, but if you watched it a number of times, you'd see oh, there's T-1000 in the background. Oh, there's Humphrey Bogart in the background. Here, it's very different. Here, it was, they put a whole bunch of details in, but also focused you on the details. And a lot of those details really matter. Um, so it's a very different exercise of going through to look for these things because there were so many instances of your eye specifically being drawn to one of those details. Yeah, much, much of it. That's a great point. Uh, do you want to go first? Sure. I will kick us off with... I don't know who in the prop department came up with this, but the gold cell phone. Oh, you already took my first one. <laughs> that was incredible. Um, I'm going to say Bolo columns because Julia had a hard time navigating those. Yes. And it, it, I have done that. Again, <laughs> maybe I don't want to give anything away, but as a man who wears glasses, I very much uh, sympathize with that uh, situation. <laughs> I'm going to say Bolo, um, a locator beacon. Great one. Uh, Bolo, two Kevin Dunn's. 
That that is a good one. I heard there's a a little anecdote about the actor Kevin Dunn ended up getting the hotel room intended for the the character Kevin Dunn, and it was obviously a far fancier hotel room. Actor Kevin Dunn did not have as high a profile as the actor Gary Sinise did at the time. Yeah, I heard that as well. So it has to be true. It I'm, and then I read it, it on I read it on the internet. So. Yeah, likewise. And they they found out, and then they had to awkwardly kick the actor Kevin Dunn out of his <laughs> out of his suite so that the person who was playing Kevin Dunn, Gary Sinise, would take it. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to go with a bolo, a class ring. Good one, bolo all sport. If you don't remember that, it was a it was a competitor to Gatorade. There was an advertisement for All Sport in this movie. One of the biggest, uh, the champions of All Sport uh, was Shaquille O'Neal back in the day. His sport drink of choice. I wonder what happened to that because I feel like sport drinks kind of took off. It was probably just a little ahead of its time. Didn't Pepsi? I think Pepsi owned All Sport and then they bought Gatorade, so they didn't have to have their own sport drink anymore. Makes sense. You can't beat them. Join them. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with. A very disappointing boxing robe. Yep, very disappointing. Uh, Bolo, blood money. That's a good one. (laughs) I'm going to go Bolo, seahorse mannequins. Seahorse mannequins. Wow. Wow, that's a good, that's a deep cut. That's good. Uh, Bolo, learning what makes a conspiracy. Uh, I do now know what makes this a conspiracy, (laughs) thanks to this movie. (laughs) Likewise. I'm going to go with Bolo. One busted umbrella. <laughs> uh, Bolo, the term girly man. Makes a couple, a couple appearances, I think. Yep, it does. I'm going to go Bolo, a keg in the hotel. I had that too. Uh, a beer spraying party. I wondered how they got that in there. I feel like maybe security used to be different than it was today. Yeah, I don't. Uh, we both went to college and had times. I don't remember parties where people would just uh, spray each other with beer. <laughs> like a waste. All right, I'm going to go with Bolo. Discussion about drowning. That really doesn't make any sense. Yeah, none at all. Uh, Bolo, an unexpected left hook outside the ring. Maybe the only uh, good punch you see in the entire movie. <laughs> Definitely. All right, my, my last Bolo here, and I had to narrow the list down. I'm going to go Bolo, a ruby ring. Yeah, that's a great one. It's very easy to miss. I'll go with my last one. Uh, Bolo... Story about pirates. It's a great story. It's, it's a great, great story. story. I didn't see it coming at that part of the movie, but it's a, it's a great story. All right, let's move on to a uh, drink to pair with the movie. I'll go first. It's pretty simple, but uh, I like movies that do this. They have awesome carafes and awesome glasses, and it's sort of like a symbol of like a high-end place. I would just go with a whiskey or a scotch neat. There are a couple times where there's just these just amazing glassware and uh, readily available high-end liquor. And I think it, this movie works very, very well if you're sipping on a really good whiskey or scotch while you view it. I, I couldn't agree more. And my, my drink goes fits in exactly with yours. And I'm going to say a couple of martinis. It's fight Basically, night. Perfectly with the glassware, perfectly with the, the classiness of the scene. And a couple of martinis even makes an appearance at one point. In the movie. Yes, it does. All right, enjoy the movie and we'll see you on the other side. I'm on TV. Hi, Rick Santoro. Hello, Hello Richard Santoro. Ah, I'm Ricky! And I am the king! Watch carefully. A crime is about to be committed. Now listen to me, Mr. Secretary. I am telling you, you're the one that's going to be sorry. You will be a witness. And the hardest thing to spot will be the truth. It was a phantom punch. Five people make a conspiracy, right? You're all alone on this. The house wins. What a fun time. I cannot believe the ratings on that movie. I, I really can't believe that the audience score was so low. It doesn't make any sense. And, and again, I could sort of get the critics piece. Uh, you know, this isn't this isn't the hoity-toity type of film that critics tend to like but it was one of those films that thriller was a perfect description of what this movie is and it's like anytime i'm scrolling through netflix and like a movie is described as a thriller i will probably at least consider watching it i completely agree let's start off with the draft there's a lot of choices in this one who is your first pick overall 
I'm glad I have this first pick. There's 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 nothing else that I can possibly do here but take Nicholas Cage. Oh, I mean, he is he w- without him, and you could say this for probably every Nicholas Cage movie, with maybe a few exceptions. But without him, this movie is nothing. This is a fly under the radar, watch it on an airplane movie. But I mean, maybe that's a bit much. But <laughs> Nicholas Cage, he he steals every scene. He just absolutely crushes it on every moment that he is on camera. And he brings this, this energy and excitement to the film that is unparalleled. I hands he, down got to take Nick Cage. He shows his range in such short bursts too, that, that are so close together. Like the beginning part when he's switching calls on his phone between his wife, his mistress, and he's talking to people as he's coming up and it's so fast paced. And he switches almost his identity when he gets on the phone with his wife versus when he's on the phone with his mistress and we see it all play out in one shot, which is just incredible. Yeah, it's, I mean, he, he has that skill of just turning up every single thing that his character is going through to such an extreme that it makes it easy for regular Joes like us to watch the film and know exactly what's going on with that character. You know, he makes it easy for us, and I appreciate that. Yeah, there was a scene uh, when he was talking to Julia in the stairwell, and he was, like, getting mad at her. And you were like, why is he being so such a jerk to this person who's trying to do a nice thing? And then he he just says, like, because now I have to do something I didn't I don't want to do no matter which way I go. Like, it was just such a great scene because he just kind of came off like a jerk. And then you sympathize with him right afterwards. Like, that's right. This is going to mean a lot for you. (laughs) It's not just that you found out that there's this huge conspiracy. This means you might have to end a friendship or look the other way. And these are some really, really tough decisions. And he, he, he just he just nailed that scene. That was one of my favorite scenes in the whole film. I thought that was just, it was, it was exactly as you said. It was confusing at first. He's like, why is he so angry? But he takes you through this series of emotions that he's going through. And he's, you know, for the first time having to face this moral dilemma that clearly from what you see in the rest of the, the early part of the film, he has maybe never experienced a moral dilemma because it seems like he just sort of flies in the seat of his pants, does whatever he wants and doesn't really have any consequences. And that seems to be working pretty well for him. And this is the first time where it's really been a challenge because he's just faced with such a, such a a problem and and he doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. And just like his buddy Dunn says, like, just do what you always do, take the money and look the other way. And this was just something that his moral radar just could not allow it to happen, which it's, for the first part of the movie, you didn't even know he had one. Yeah, and you almost you almost feel him growing that conscious as the scene develops. Yeah, that's a great pick. I, I, if he's the star of the movie, I think the 1A, 1B star would be the camera work. So my first pick would be the camera work. This movie, like, even if you have problems with the, for this is for the critics, even if you have problems with the plot or the ending or the reveal of who the bad guy was too soon or the waiting 10 minutes to see the Ruby at the end of the movie, whatever the critics would have a problem with the camera work alone in this movie is worth at least 70% critics loving it. It is such a display of talent by De Palma, like the opening 20 minute scene, basically like a one take stream, like to put that together and like the rolling camera through the walls or over the ceiling through the rooms to see room by room. The camera work in this was just like, it's like a film class. Uh, would have to show this to show how important the camera work is in movies. Cause so it, I was just blown away by the camera work of this movie. So that's my first pick. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, an obvious first pick. I that I had that next on my list in my, in my mock draft here. It did feel like a, a film school. I feel like I, I ended up learning a bunch because I was watching this. I was like, Oh, how did he, how do you do that? Those shots where he has someone in the, in focus in the foreground and someone in focus in the background. Apparently that's called a split diopter. I know that now. I've basically gone to film school. Yeah, um, did. And it was just, the whole thing was beautifully shot. That opening scene, we both love opening scenes that just put you into a movie and really get you feeling what the character is feeling, feeling the, the sense of place. And I thought that that uninterrupted shot to start the film off really just gets you into this whirlwind of not only the fight night and the craziness there, but also the total insanity of Rick Santoro's life. Like you're just sucked in by his presence and his aura and the, the, the way they shot that really made you feel that. Absolutely. And they had the, the point of view camera from multiple different perspectives. 
there were, I don't remember many movies that have done that before where, I mean, you have the boxer's point of view, you have uh, Gary Sinise's point of view, you have multiple people's point of view and you see the camera, you know, you see what's going on from their perspective, which was just like so mind blowing. It almost had to take a second. Like, Oh wait, this isn't a camera anymore. This is the, I'm looking through the eyes of a character here. So especially I, that scene from like Lincoln Taylor. And there's like that, that crazy room with um, Cyrus. And then you get to re see that scene when Nicholas Cage sees Lincoln Taylor for the first time from Lincoln Ty- Tyler, Lincoln Tyler's perspective. Yeah. It was just incredible. It's like, whoa, we're seeing it. It's like a mirror. We're seeing it from the other side now. I love that POV too. It made me think of like, I feel like it's a common tactic in horror movies, like classic horror movies. You'd have the, the camera from the point of view of the attacker or something like that. But I, it, it isn't something that really seemed to jump the genre to other types of films that I can really think of. And this one did it unbelievably successfully. It almost makes it easier to understand the plot. It, it again, like helps you and I along to, to figure out what's going on by using that, that technique. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my second pick, I think I just, I hadn't seen the movie in a while and I didn't really know what Nicolas Cage's character, who he was. So that badge reveal, like five minutes in, I didn't like you see him talk with a, a bookie, talk with his mistress, be a jerk to his wife about the pizza. He does that like yummy line. He messed up his buddy's hair before he goes on camera. He's just like an absolute jerk. And then, you know, he sees Cyrus and he he gets questioned in the basement and he just holds up his badge. And you're like, oh, my God, he's a cop. And he just seemed like he was just some rat from Atlantic City, just some like some nobody, you know, shyster or whatever from the from the area. But like he's a cop, he's a dirty cop. And you just realize that like right when he picked up his uh, his badge. Yeah, I, I, that's a great pick. And I think it also sort of, again, sets the tone for the whole movie because the whole movie, you're kind of, you have this uneasy feeling because you don't really know what's going on. You don't have a sense of what the facts are. And just like that, in the first five minutes of the film, you're like, is this guy a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Is he a cop? Is he a criminal? You don't know. And then there's that moment where you suddenly get like a bit of a reveal, like, oh, all right, he's a cop. But then it's like, even even after the reveal, you're like, well, but like, what kind of a cop is he? <laughs> all right, for my second pick, and, and I guess this kind of goes with the style of the film, but I just love any time a movie is shot and you and you experience it in real time. Like this movie, with the, with the exception of the very end, after the whole scene on the boardwalk, start to finish, you're experiencing the movie the same time as the characters in the film are. And I love when movies do that. I think it's especially for movies like this, where you are so wrapped up in the, the experience. It's just a great way to bring you into the movie itself. And I think you really feel that in this film. It's almost like an episode or movie based around like the, the concept of like 24, right? You have an hour for this episode and all this is happening with an hour because in the beginning, you know, after the snipers, uh, after the sniper scene, they say the cops will be here in an hour, an hour and a half. And it is an hour, an hour and a half. So yeah, it was all very real time. And I, I completely agree. I'm always in when a movie is just like being shot at the same pace that we're viewing it. Yeah. It's just a, it's a great way to, to feel like you're almost a part of the movie. The uh, last pick here, I'm going to go with both the character, Jimmy George, and the, also the performance of that character by, by Michael Rispoli. He went toe to toe with cage in every scene that he was in with cage and he was amazing i was watching this i was like how is this guy not a primetime movie star you're talking about the bookie yeah the bookie he he absolutely was i mean he was the second best character in my mind in the whole film he was he was so convincing and just perfectly played i know him from two other movies when i see him i think of uh, Death to Smoochie. I don't know if you've seen that, but he is absolutely, absolutely. It's one of the, it's a dark comedy with Robin Williams and he is absolutely incredible as like a punch drunk boxer. Um, such a great role in uh, Mr. 3000 uh, mm-hmm. baseball movie. He was yep. like the catcher for, uh, you know, some team, he became a bartender. He, he would just like, he would just reiterate the line of the main character, or, uh, Bernie Mac. So I know him from those two movies and he he's, Oh, and also from, um, Matt Damon, Ed Norton, poker. Oh, rounders. Rounders. 
Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Rounders. yeah. So he's from right. Rounders and he was incredible in Rounders. I can't believe that he didn't have a bigger career because he was such a great character in Rounders. He could have even been the same character here and in Rounders. He seemed to have a bit more of a heart here than in Rounders. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, Rounders you're right. maybe it is uh, later uh, after he's had some hard times. <laughs> that's a great choice. Wow. I didn't see that coming, but that's perfect. I'm going to go with the, my, my, my third pick, the hero turn versus the heel turn, which I guess there was also a heel turn too, but like coming into it, Ricky was the bad guy almost because he's the dirty cop and he met his buddy, the commander, Gary Sinise, who's the good guy. And then it flips where the bad guy becomes a good guy. The good guy becomes a bad guy. A lot of times there is like a heel turn where like the, the good guy becomes a bad guy, but it, it's such a weird thing because you would expect... Nicholas Cage's character to take the money and look the other way. Cause that would just goes along with everything else he's done in his life, but it just hits some sort of like moral crossroads where he just then was like, no, I can't do this. And I have to stand up for this, this woman's life. And I'm, I can't kill someone. I can't do it. He looks at the blood money and he, that's just not who he is. So it's the hero turn um, from who you would think would be the heel that I thought was really impressive. This movie that's one of the things that's so great about this movie is you, you get you get both turns yep and they kind of happen right around the same time and it sort of just whips you around and that's again part of the uneasy feeling because it's you know who can you trust who's a good guy who's a bad guy and it's just toying with you the entire time yeah it was very very well done all right we'll get to our sleep around sleep around and I, I had two things that i was debating about i guess one will probably maybe just fall to the honorable mentions but i guess for my sleeper pick i'm gonna go with I love when they make a song just for the movie. Oh, I right. was going to bring this up. Yep, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I like more. I want to, I want uh, Go Ninja Go, Adam's Family Values. I want all of it. Mention the movie in the song. <laughs> Absolutely. Got to mention the movie. It's got to be a little bit ridiculous. And I thought that that ending scene with the construction workers where this song Sin City by Meredith Brooks. And I, I never heard of Meredith Brooks, but. Well, you know uh, her one song. She was a one hit wonder aside yeah, from. Uh, bitch. Yes. I'm a yes. bitch. I'm a yep. mother. That one. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's great because you're like, all right, this is, this is, I got to listen to this song because this is so ridiculous. And this is like this very odd construction worker scene going on. And then at the end, you get the payoff of hanging around. You get to see that Ruby in the, in the pillar at the very end as well. The name of the title the song Sin City was a little questionable. I mean, they're in Atlantic City, correct? They are in Atlantic City. Sin City is a bit of a misnomer. Seems like you either just call it Snake Eyes, that's a pretty obvious one, or Atlantic City, also another obvious one. I guess she's just singing about places that have gambling. That's a great pick. Um, I'm going to go with the the sniper scene where the um, Secretary of Defense and her get shot it has to be good too because we saw it like 10 different times that one scene where he gets shot and she gets shot in the arm and there's the uh, slow-mo saving of her by Nicolas Cage and then uh, Lincoln Tyler is like wakes up for a second and closes his eyes and pretends like he was down the whole time like that whole scene was just incredible they went over from so many different angles and every time you just learn more and it was just so great every single time yeah, that scene was was amazing. And it, it all those scenes where they showed it a number of times made me just wonder. I mean, I, they must have just shot them over and over again, but everything looked so consistent. It 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 felt like they had to just have, you know, like a thousand cameras going on the entire time. But they must have just shot it over and over and over again and did it so well that it looked like it was flawless. Yeah, absolutely. Did you have any My other? only other uh I had like an honorable mention. This is when they're they're in the the TV booth studio and they're watching the when it's Cage and Gary Sinise up at the end and Gary Sinise sees the the video and picks up the remote I guess and just hits the erase button. When it goes, <laughs> uh, I don't mention is the erase button. It's like I've never seen an erase button on a on a VCR or anything before, but it was just it was just perfect. It was just you hit the guy hits a race and then a race pops up on the screen. You're like, oh, all right, well, so much for that. That's it. All that footage is gone now. Yeah, that's a that's a great one. Uh, I just think that left punch from Cage on the reporter out of nowhere. So good. I can't it, stop laughing every time I see that. It's just he just like argues him for a second and then just punches him out of nowhere he lays him out to it. It, it it was so surprising that it i wonder if that was real like if that was not part of the script 
And Cage, I mean, you, you never know with Cage, right? Like he takes this very seriously. He might've thought the only way this works is if no one knows how to do this. And he might've just lit that guy up. I absolutely agree. He was probably just like pestering Cage on set, like, I don't know, asking for an autograph or like cut him in line at the donuts. And Cage was like, all right, I'm going to get this guy later. Yeah, that was a, that was a that was a great punch, best punch of the whole movie. Uh, well, also another punch. <laughs> Nicholas Cage is getting his butt kicked by uh, the heavyweight champ of the world, and he was taking it and mocking the champ during the whole thing, calling him a girly man again. And champ, this is the best you got. And I don't know if it's a situation where it's like the lid of a of a jar being loosened, so maybe it's like he hit the tipping point. But all it took was one punch from Dunn to just knock him flat. He had been getting punched in the face by the heavyweight champ for like five minutes, but one punch from his buddy and he was out cold. I mean, that, that had to be it because Gary Sinise is not going to knock anybody out if they're not, you know, been buttered up already. No, absolutely not. All right. Do you want to get to our superlatives? Um, So our superlative this week for this movie is best yelled line, uh, which maybe should be our superlative for any Nicolas Cage movie that we do. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, he yells a line better than anyone probably in the history of, of film. I, I can't think of anybody who's even in second place here. I mean, he, nope. It's probably like his signature style. I would have to agree. So I'm, I'm going to go with, uh, and this comes in the scene in the in the bar after the after the fight when Rick is talking to Tyler and he's having this very intense conversation. He's outlining how he's sort of putting the pieces together. And then they're in this very intense moment. And then he just cuts in and says, and you signed my kid's autograph. (laughs) And it's just so, you know, out of the blue, but it's also a very clear little nugget of insight into Rick's whole character and these transactional relationships that he has. Cause clearly he's a terrible father. Uh, He doesn't want to talk to his son on the phone. He doesn't want, he's cheating on the kid's mom, but he sees his way to get back into his kid's good graces he gets this autograph from a fighter that his kid probably doesn't even care about, but he sees this is his opportunity to get something out of, out of Tyler, get it for his son and be the hero again. So I thought that was just, it was a a perfectly delivered line. And also again, showed you a really important part of the character. I think that's a great pick. I mean, that was going to be my pick. So I'll say my, my choice, but I think we should go over a couple honorable mentions after because there's just so many great yelled lines here. So uh, mine is basically the end of that opening sequence before the fight. And Nicolas Cage, his line is, I was made for this sewer, baby, and I am the king. And then, like, the the ding of the bell hits, yep. and then we're right into it. He stands up and opens his arms as if he's, like, in the rock at the ending, that whole, like, yep. Jesus pose thing. Yeah, so, that was a great. I, I was made for this sewer, baby, and I am the king would be my favorite yelled line. Yeah, that's a great one. I mean, it was almost like the, that was like the culmination of that entire entrance scene that just gets you whipped up into a frenzy. Absolutely. So a couple honorable mentions. When he walks up to the camera in the beginning, I'm Ricky. That whole thing, that was, really, that was a little strange. <laughs> yeah, baby. Go, baby. Yeah. I, was he trying to go for an Austin Powers type thing? I don't, I don't know. I kind of feel like he was just feeling it. <laughs> yep. He's not copying anyone. He's his own person. Yeah. And I think the go Tyler, go Tyler, go Tyler, go chant as he was coming down the escalator was, mm-hmm. was pretty good as well. Yeah. It's just the excitement and the energy that, that he brings to this movie and every movie is something that, you know, I think we could all aspire to. Absolutely. I don't know if this is going to be a hard one, but uh, one change to be a blockbuster. What do you got? This is a tough one. Cause I think this movie was great, but I think my one change to be a blockbuster and this important distinction here, I think this is one change to be a blockbuster, not necessarily what I think would make it a better movie, but I think maybe this would have done better is the, the do the reveal later. Let us let the audience linger a little bit longer in this uncertainty of who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, what, what facts are real, what facts aren't real, who's remembering what, what's just a being misremembered. They, they sort of, they, you, you find out that Gary Sinise's character is the bad guy a little before halfway through the movie, which I think is just a little bit, it's atypical for sure for this type of movie. And I think people weren't ready for that to an extent. And it didn't fit the sort of mold about how this type of suspense movie works. Cause it did to some extent flip from being a, a sort of whodunit type 
movie to a more personal movie about these two guys and their their you know Nicolas Cage's struggle with uh, like understanding what their relationship is and what he is as a person. And the second half of that movie is just, it's a very different movie, which I think makes it a far more interesting movie. But in terms of making it a blockbuster, I think probably more people would have wanted to see the more traditional mysterious thriller type production. I couldn't agree more. So I, I just agree with you. Um, a lot of people had a problem with the ending of the movie. They thought once there was the big reveal on who did it, that the rest of the movie was kind of garbage. This is what, what I've read about uh, what people thought about this movie. You and I obviously disagree. But if they ha- if they held on to that reveal towards the end, then they wouldn't have that problem with the sort of choppy ending with uh, Sinise shooting through the door, hitting the keypad and like a wave hitting and, you know, them going under the car and that whole thing. It was just a little bit strange. Yeah, and it's, I, I feel like we do need to touch on the original ending just a, a bit because I'm not sure everyone knows about this, but that the, the film was originally shot with a different ending uh, where Julia's trapped in that room and Gary Sinise shoots in in the original ending they filmed this whole thing and it was very expensive they had a, a giant tidal wave come through and sort of crash over the boardwalk wash the entire thing away fill that whole cavity up with water Gary Sinise's character drowns everyone else lives oh so it was like a call back to his story that he was talking about yeah. hearing drowned soldiers wow exactly and they don't you don't have the cops busting in and him shooting himself, which which felt a little forced at the end. It, it would have I think people were very uncomfortable with the suddenness of it when they, they they screened these things in test audiences. I I don't know why they do that, but apparently the test audiences hated it. So they sort of hastily put together a different ending. That's the one that you see in the film. But you had that moment at the very end where, where Cage is talking about, you know, they were underwater and he thought he was going to drown, which clearly makes no sense because there was no giant tidal wave. That scene didn't happen. So some of it didn't even get totally polished up at the end. And I think maybe that that ending, as fanciful as it might have been, with just sort of this wave coming through and ending things, that I think that could have worked better. I, I think it would have made some of the dialogue make more sense, like the Gary Sinise story of this, uh, hearing the, the 28 soldiers drown and they don't drown quietly. Um, that would have made way more sense if that's in turn how he went as well. You could probably, they, that film probably exists. They must have like a director's cut of this somewhere where they just use that instead. All right, spinoff ideas. Uh, I'll go first on this one. I think I would just like to see a prequel to Snake Eyes. Like I want to see Ricky's rise to becoming the king of the sewer. Like his run-ins with Cyrus before, his run-ins with Jimmy the Bookie, his, his mistress Monique and his double his double life his six blocks of Atlantic city that he runs, like how did he build that all up? I would like to see the climb for, for Ricky and Nicholas Cage's character. I think that's a phenomenal idea. And I think that we should make it a trilogy oh. and on at the end that it's Ricky gets out of jail. He comes back and through the help of his TV man, TV friend, Lou, who they've patched things up after some Rocky coverage, he makes a run at becoming mayor of Atlantic city. People can put the past behind him in terms of the corruption. It's Atlantic city. Everyone's, everyone expects that. And then you see Nick cage as mayor of Atlantic city falls back into his old ways and uh, you know, hijinks and Sue. I think that's an incredible trilogy idea. The only other idea I had, and I, this is really not uh, polished up yet, but I want some sort of horror film that is that, that agent that had the Ruby ring, who is now part of the building. I want her to haunt people in the casino. And part of this is, I just don't think there has been a horror movie that takes place in a casino before. Uh, no, I don't think there has been. And that is shocking to me. I mean, anytime you go to a casino, it is a horror movie. You lose a lot of your money, but it's not, there's no <laughs> video. There's no actual horror movie. And maybe we can get a little POV of her uh, as the ghost that's haunting this, this casino. Perfect. <laughs> It'd be perfect. It's, it's just, it makes so much sense. Like, I can't believe this hasn't been a thing before. And this is just the perfect uh, opportunity to do it. Wow, that's a great one. All right, we have a trilogy uh, and a horror movie out of that. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you want to get to uh, what we're doing next week? Yeah, I'll, I'll let you kick this one off since I actually haven't seen this one yet. All right, sure. We are going to uh, do League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. So this movie... I did not realize it's one of these movies that this happens to us all the time where we don't realize something is a, is a flop and we watch the movie and you think it's great and you just move on. And then I go on like 
Rotten Tomatoes and I see that this movie is 17% critics and under 50% for audiences. Uh, but this is this is kind of like what we talked about in um, Last Action Hero of what we wanted to see with like all these famous heroes and villains come out of the screen. And what we wanted to see was like King Kong and Dracula come alive and watch them in a movie. And we get to see some notable people from literature like come alive in this movie. And it's just a fantastic ride and a fun movie. And I can't wait to do it. I, I read the synopsis of it and it, I, I can't believe I haven't seen this. I don't know what I've been doing with my life. So I'm, I'm very excited. Can't wait. Sounds great. Well, this was a lot of fun and uh, talk to you next time. Yeah. Later. Later. Later.